very few women drive heavy machines like I do. I got my license through a driving school in northern Uganda. This was the education my brother could afford after my aunt stopped paying my school fees. I enjoy driving, but sometimes I get exhausted. But I feel happy and proud to be among the few women who drive. My family is very proud, especially my elder brother. This job has made me independent. I can afford my necessities and I also help my family. I also plan to go back to school. My dream is to one day get a home that we can call our own. And I hope to get married and raise a family. Thanks to Olivia from Uganda. She speaks for the hundreds of thousands of people who've gotten a proper job through the investments that Northland has been doing over the years. And job creation is the essence of our mission and something we're going to speak about today. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Northland Conference 2019. Uh, moving money, improving lives. My name is Telef Tulefson, I'm the CEO of Northland, and I'm happy to welcome all of you. Um, this room takes some 320 people, and we had more than 400 people signing up for today. And um, we discussed what to do. I suggested running musical chairs and uh, see who could win a seat, but I didn't quite get that through. So instead, there's some streaming uh, in parallel going upstairs. So there's some people in the room above us, and thanks for joining. Great that you can take part in this. Um, I was presented as the new CEO of Norfan one year ago at the Norfan conference. Um, it's been a busy, interesting, and rewarding year. Um, and uh, I've been on a steep learning curve, and uh, also been energized by being part of a team that is highly motivated, energized, and, and with passion. I've also had the chance to visit a number of our companies, and seeing the companies, being out in the field, has really sort of further convinced me that what we're doing is important and that the model we are pursuing works out. Uh, hopefully this afternoon you'll get a feel for what we're doing and our passion. Um, our aim is to share some insights, to exchange views, to discuss challenges, and also to inspire. Um, we will also present some of our investee companies, some of our partners, and other thought leaders and practitioners in the field. Um, we will try to demonstrate that businesses can actually attack social issues whilst also offering attractive financial opportunities. But before doing so, I would like to ask some questions. And the, re the way we're going to do it is to run a mentee. A mentee, you have to pick up your phones. First, we ask you to put store your phones away, but now you pick it up. And you go to the browser and you write menti.com. You don't need Wi-Fi because you can do it on 3G or 4G. You push menti.com, and the conference code is 937337, as you can see on the screen. And, um, and as you are able to log on, uh, we will put forward one question. So, and the first question is, how many Africans enter the job market every year? 10 to 12 million, four to six, or one to two? Well, it seems that you guys are very much on track. It's an educated group. You're correct. It's actually as much as 10 to 12 million. And, but there are only some three million jobs created every year which speaks for the constant deficit that we're facing in terms of being able to provide enough jobs. Second question, what share of global investments went to the world's poorest countries in 2018? Is it 7.5%, 12.2% or 1.8%? And once again, it sounds that this is a bright group of people we've gotten together which I really appreciate. You, you're right, actually. It's as little as 1.8%. And um, in comparison, the OECD countries received more than 
And in the LDCs, there's about a billion people. In OECD, there's like 1.2 billion people, which says a lot about the capitalist dreams. Clearly, the GDP is higher, but still, it says a lot about how capital is being allocated in the world and something we'll come back to later today. Third question. Which country has the world's highest GDP growth rate during the last five years? Vietnam, Ethiopia, or India? Great, you see the picture? Yes, you're right, it's <laughs> Ethiopia. And, um, and but it's impressing uh, that so many, particularly Eastern African countries, and countries like Ethiopia have a you know, phenomenal growth rate these days. Um, Ethiopia grew 9.3% last five years. India 7.6, Vietnam 6.6. And the G7 countries grew by about 1.9% in the same period, which says a lot about the opportunity and also the opportunity loss in, in that region. Lastly, mobile phone subscription. What do you reckon? How many, what share of the population have a mobile phone coverage or, or subscription rates? 20%, 50 or 70? Yes, you're right. And there's actually more, there are more mobile phones in Africa than the toothbrushes. <laughs> so it also says a lot about the possibility of building services, the possibility of reaching people, and, and the opportunity that is there. Uh, the picture we're given tend to be very biased. That being said, I'd like to move on, and I'd like to introduce our moderators today. Uh, we will be moderated by uh, Nana uh, Finn and Ilva Lindberg. Please come up. Nana is our regional director at the East Africa office. She's a savvy investor with experience from Nigeria, the US, and, and now living in Accra, Ghana, coming back from the US to build Ghana and West Africa. And uh, Ilva Lindberg uh, has an impressive career uh, long before Northern, being a pioneer in, in combining investing with sustainability. And now we're lucky to have her here. If you go. Thank you, Tele, for that introduction. And uh, welcome once again to all of you to the Norfund Conference 2019, Moving Money, Improving Lives. I'd like to welcome all of you here in the audience, but also all of you who are here on the live stream, both upstairs, because we couldn't fit you all here in the room, and across the globe. Our first speaker took on the role as Norway's Minister for International Development in January this year. He hasn't wasted any time. He's already traveling extensively in the developing world, and we're already impressed by his deep understanding of the issues we face in the markets we're investing in. It's my pleasure to welcome Minister Dagenge Ulstein. Yes. Thank you so much, and I'm so pleased to be here together with you today and uh, discuss such uh, important topics that are so crucial for development. And I also have to say it's good to, to have uh, such an inspiring team and such a visionary and hands-on CEO, so um, it's, it's good to be here uh, today. In February, less than um, two weeks into my position as Minister of uh, International Development, I visited Ethiopia. And as you all know, Ethiopia, the giant um, on the African continent, it has a population on, of more than 100 million, which is rapidly increasing, as well as a high pro proportion of young people. While I was visiting the country, I was told that there is a need for 2 million new jobs annually in order to keep up pace with population growth, and that is 40,000 new jobs every week. Job creation is a challenge across Africa, and the working age population is growing rapidly, which means much greater pressure to provide jobs. In sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, 20 million jobs, new jobs need to be created every year in the coming years. And this means that job creation needs to be doubled compared with the two previous decades. 
Job creation is so vital, as already mentioned, for feeding the population, generating tax revenues, and building sustainable societies. But there is much more than this at stake. When a young, educated population has no prospect of ever finding decent work, it is not only resources that are wasted and opportunities that are lost. This is also a recipe for social conflicts, and it can undermine whole societies. Estimate shows that if we are to reach the sustainable development goals, we need additional funding equivalent to 18 times global official development assistance every year up until 2030. The lion's share of this funding will have to come from the developing countries themselves. This is why domestic resource mobilization has become such a hot topic in the developing community. The private sector has a key role to play in this context. Norfund has shown that developing markets offer great opportunities. Norfund's investments contribute to development by helping to generate tax revenues, create jobs for both women and men, provide power from renewable sources and make credit available for small and medium-sized enterprises. I have made several trips to countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia recently and have met a number of representatives of businesses, both managers and workers. I have been impressed by what can be achieved in these markets, which are often considered to be risky and challenging. I have met representatives of companies that are very conscious and proud of their sustainable business models. My impression is that the private sector wants to play a positive role in development, a role that goes beyond generating the best possible returns for its shareholders. Many companies have shown that they can contribute to improving the society where they are operating while still achieving strong financial returns. However, we need more capital and investments in these markets. As said, less than 2% of foreign direct investments goes to the least developed countries. There is enormous potential for more private sector development in many underserved markets. Increased investments have the potential to boost development and lift people out of poverty. One of the ambitions set out in the Norwegian government's policy platform is to strengthen cooperation with the Norwegian private sector. In order to increase job creation and investments in developing countries, Africa is changing rapidly and many countries are moving beyond aid. Their leaders are often more interested in discussing investments than aid grants. So we have developed a partner country concept for our bilateral development cooperation and have identified 16 partner countries. Several of these countries are in sub-Saharan Africa and we have initiated a policy dialogue with our partner countries which involves having more detailed discussions on key topics including private sector development. This also allows us to contribute and respond in a more targeted way to the policy objectives of these countries. We are now in the process of establishing private sector development plans with countries such as Ghana and Ethiopia. I have had meetings with business leaders in several places in Norway with a view to learning from their experiences of investing in emerging and developing markets. Based on these meetings, my impression is that several of the measures we have implemented to support businesses' efforts in developing countries are working well. However, it is clear that the private sector would really like us to do more. So this year, we have increased the budget for private sector development and job creation by 290 million Norwegian krona. In addition, Norfund receives annual capital allocations under the development assistance budget and the new investment capital allocation to Norfund this year amounts to almost 1.9 billion Norwegian krona. I am very pleased to note that Norfund's new strategy has a clear focus on job creation. 
Norfund's reports, Norfund reports that as many as 300,000 people were directly or indirectly employed through companies in its portfolio at the end of 2018, of which 35%, I think, were women. However, the ripple effect of job creation is perhaps even more important by helping to establish financial infrastructure, the right ecosystem, and develop energy production, Norfun enables local companies to create jobs. These companies can then become the backbone of thriving communities. Our strategy and our strategic collaboration with Norwegian and international companies is being strengthened by uh, a number of support teams that are managed by NORAD. Again, our focus is on sub-Saharan Africa with agriculture as, as the largest, largest sector. Over the past two to three years, NORAD has also made a significant contribution in the area of digitalization. Numerous projects have been supported. Some of the results we aim to achieve with this work include the following encouraging entrepreneurship and creating job opportunities for young people, transferring world-class skills and technology to developing countries, promoting the expansion of basic ICT services and infrastructure, such as digital payment systems and digital credit, introducing technology in more traditional value chains to improve efficiency and protecting jobs. Connecting marginalized groups, for example, small-scale farmers, to global value chains through the in innovative use of technology. And one of the examples that I like is IR, like the meteorological um, weather forecasts that now are shared globally, used also by farmers in Africa sub-Sahara. Just as one example of how we can use global public digital goods. Um, so that is also something that we are looking into and improving transparency and compliance through the effective use of technology. So this brings me to my last point. Job creation can only be sustainable if it contributes to developing the national resource base. Here, the importance of responsible private sector development cannot be underestimated. We expect Norwegian companies and investors to demonstrate responsible business conduct abroad, particularly in demanding markets where the host country's authorities may show little respect for human rights. So this means that both the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises should be used actively to develop strategies for ensuring responsible business conduct. Finally, I would like to stress that responsible business conduct <coughs> is essential for ensuring sustainable development, ending modern slavery and reducing the pressure on the climate. So I would like to wish the CEO and the global team all the best and good luck with the rest of this conference. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister Ulstein for impressing on us the crucial need for job creation and the important role that we can play in addressing this need. At this point, I'd like to welcome our next speaker. She is one of only four African women managing partners of a private equity firm in Africa. Ms. Berhani Demisi is managing partner of Cepheus Growth Capital Partners, a private equity fund that invests in small and medium-sized Ethiopian companies. Nor Fund is an investor in Cepheus's current fund. Please welcome Berhani to tell us how and why international investments are essential to economic growth and job creation in emerging markets, especially in Africa. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as uh, Nana said, I'm Berhani Demse the co-founder and managing partner of CFS Growth Capital Partners. We are a private equity firm investing in private businesses in Ethiopia, building them to be financially sustainable, impactful on the community and the environment while creating jobs and prosperity. 
We also produce primary economic research on Ethiopia, which we make widely available to address the information gap in what is the se Africa's second largest country. I thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today about the subject matter that is critical for Africa to help achieve a better tomorrow for the next generation. Today, I would like to talk to you about three key points, which are first, why private investment capital is necessary for Africa to grow and prosper. Number two, that the private sector is critical for job creation and uh, poverty reduction because of the direct and indirect impact businesses have on society. And number three, with investors like Norfund behind us, I'd like to show you how we work to have deep and deliberate impact on uh, when we invest to grow financially sustainable businesses serving the local markets. We believe that will have impact on people, companies, and the macro economy. So private, we've said private investment is critical uh, and necessary for Africa to go and prosper. The good news is that sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see on the chart, has been over the last 10 years growing at a relatively high pace and is expected to continue to grow around 4% annually. East Africa is growing at even higher rates, growing ar uh, around 5 to 6% annually. By comparison, the Europe area is growing at around 2% per year. Even though growth has made gains in poverty reduction, the growth we are seeing in sub-Saharan Africa is not enough still to meet many of the targets associated with the Sustainable Development Goals. The graph here shows that the number of extremely poor in the world since 1990 split by region. As you can see, huge gains have been made, particularly in East Asia and South Asia. In percent percentage terms, all regions have seen improvements, but unfortunately, the absolute number of poor in sub-Saharan Africa is still rising. Therefore, it's imperative more investments are needed to make similar improvements in Africa as in uh, East and South Asia, because capital has been one of the biggest reasons for these regions to have made the improvements they have today. More private capital alongside sound governance and enabling environment are therefore critical ingredients for sub-Saharan Africa to reduce the number of poor like the Asian countries. The private sector is therefore critical for job creation. This is the world population uh, today, a little more than 7 billion in total. Some regions will grow at a much faster rate than others. And in 2015, the world will look like this. Asia will increase from 4.6 to 5.3 billion, but most of the other regions will stay approximately the same. Africans' population, on the other hand, will increase from 1.3 billion to 2.5 billion by 2050. What this means is, in 2050, every fourth person on Earth will be an African. As an example, Nigeria is growing most rapidly. Its current population is the seventh uh, largest and is projected to surpass that of the United States and become the third largest country in the world. More than 80% of the population growth will occur in cities through urbanization. Africa will have more than 100 cities with greater than 1 million people. Therefore, Africa will be a key market in the world economy. However, to achieve a healthy and sustainable African market, we need to create jobs and reduce poverty. And the biggest opportunity we have is to use the private sector. As per the World Bank data, Africa's population is currently growing faster than the jobs being created. During the next 20 years, the population expected to grow by 450 million, but the number of new jobs is expected to grow by 100 million. But every year, 10 to 12 million Africans enter the job market, but only 3 million new jobs are created. This creates risk from poverty and instability, and an opportunity as creating these jobs is a business opportunity for the private sector. 
This gap cannot be met by governments alone. We know that approximately nine out of 10 jobs created are in the private sector. Therefore, there's an urgent need for private sector investment in Africa. The growth of the private sector also frees up the government budget to spend on essential goods and services to those that need it the most. Fortunately, there are significant opportunities for private sector to engage in Africa. Sorry. Africa has a large domestic market, strong GDP growth, a nascent private sector, investment incentives, and numerous underdeveloped and underserved sectors with growth and regional integration, creating the potential for large scope investments and opportunities across many sectors and countries. Taking, uh, zooming in into Ethiopia, uh, I've been engaged as one of the first people in private equity for the opportunities I just mentioned now and for the impact it has on my country. Ethiopia provides immense opportunities for private equity firms to build and strengthen companies, impl implement global standards, and achieve growth that benefits many. Ethiopia has a population of over 100 million and a young and trainable workforce ideal for light manufacturing and labor intensive production. The government is also focused on investments and job creation. Currently, they're reforming the regulatory framework to ease doing business in the country. The government is also opening up previously closed sectors for foreign investors, such as the telco. There is growing regional integration within Africa. This is uh, with the recently enacted African Continental Free Trade Agreement, in addition to regional trade blocks such as COMESA bringing markets together. Most African countries, including Ethiopia, are also beneficiary of the African Growth and Ag Opportunity Act and Everything Bar Arms Act, providing clear and competitive advantages for exports. So CVS has raised its fund with support from developmental partners such as Norfund, allowing the firm to participate in private equity sector development and in the private sector of the country while tapping into the significant investment opportunities. As I mentioned earlier, we impact people, the macroeconomy and companies. And how do we do that? So what we've done within CFS is really map out the impact of our fund over its life on the different pillars of the economy. And I'll highlight the four key areas that we believe will have a significant impact investing in the country through CFS fund. The first pillar is supporting livelihoods through jobs and incomes. We estimate the fund will create close to 2,400 direct new jobs and approximately impact 60,000 livelihoods indirectly supported due to extra income effects. The second pillar that we're looking at is the macroeconomic impact through taxes and local purchases and exports. We estimate that through our fund, we'll generate about 300 million in new taxes to benefit the government, about $750 million in extra local purchases to benefit suppliers and SMEs, and $950 million in additional exports to benefit broader macroeconomy. The third pillar that we're tracking is our human capital development impact and ESG standards. Through knowledge transfer to at least two thirds of the direct beneficiaries and implementation of international standards of environmental and social governance and systems in all our investing companies will have significant impact on human capital development. The fourth pillar that we have is we're targeting approximately 30% of our fund to be uh, portfolio companies owned and run by women. I'd like to give you a breakdown of the one of the portfolio uh, companies that will build in, into these figures that we'll be tracking in our, in our fund impact. It's a construction material, materials manufacturing example, and we like this business as it is as a significant demand for the product due to rapid urbanization and for the, its real potential for import substitution. So we have agreed uh, to implement uh, changes and, impl uh, and support the workforce, and we believe that 
for that direct uh, jobs, approximately 80% of our investment will be going towards completion of the, a new factory uh, facilitating expansion. And such expansion of the factory will create 395 new permanent jobs, of which 35% will be from low income category. To support this group, we plan to have one, active recruitment from rural areas with transportation available, provide conducive env environment for young mothers to work through access to a crash at work, also have on-the-job training for mobility and to move employees out of the low-income category. And 20% of our, our investment will go to support operations, occupational health and safety, environmental and safety improvements, systems, governance, and training. This will facilitate our, one of our pillars of knowledge transfer to at least two-thirds of the new jobs created. On the indirect side, the company currently has its input supplies agreement with cooperatives that organize low-income youth groups. We would like to further strengthen this by providing training to the youth so that their supply level increases with the company's demand. That is for their ability to scale with the company and interlinking the company's growth to the community's income. This will create 150 new jobs and increase income of existing youth suppliers. Further create 100 new jobs, opportunities in transport distribution and retail activities. So the key thing I would like to highlight here is while we have the impact of direct and indirect jobs for this one investment, the key highlight here is that we believe it's critical to link the company's growth to the indirect jobs for sustainability that supports their path to graduate out of the low-income group category and grow with the company that we invest in. Looking forward, Africa will continue to have a high growth, strengthening of governance and institutions, and improving incentives for investment while providing opportunity to provide significant impact. But there is still a, challenge, a challenging business environment and a continent of countries rather than united Africa requiring deep market understanding, ability to build relationships and a long-term perspective. Therefore, private investment capital is essential to fund economic growth throughout the private sector, to, to, to grow the private sector, which is critical for job creation and poverty reduction because of the direct and indirect impact we have. Investments will have impact on people through capacity building, job creation, poverty reduction. Private sector will have impact on businesses, institutionalization and governance. Macroeconomic impact through taxes. Investing money the right way will unlock growth, prosperity and impact. And I believe it can be done. Thank you. Many thanks, Burhan, for that informative address. In Addis Ababa at the UN's Development Finance Summit in 2015, world leaders announced the ambition of moving from billions to trillions in capital directed towards development in order to achieve our collective de developmental goals. We're not delivering. Today, less than 2%, as you've heard, of international investments go to the least developed countries. And in recent years, we've actually seen capital flows to the countries that needed the most decline. To address the reasons why this is happening and what the implications are, let's welcome Mr. Sonny Kapoor, founder and managing director of the international think tank, Redefine. I'm gonna try and not talk about development. Instead, I'm gonna focus on us, right? So assume I don't care about people in Africa. Assume I don't care about climate change. Assume I'm the most cynical bastard you can imagine. The only thing I care about is my own selfish interest here, my future, my prosperity, my profit, right? So that's the hat I have on today. I'm not actually a bastard, but. <laughs> um, so there are four fundamental tenets of finance. I'm afraid we are violating all of them. Number one, 
finance is supposed to flow downhill from where there is too much money and not enough investment opportunities to where the investment opportunities are and not enough savings. Number two, your grandmother said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Finance says the same. Diversify. Don't have all your risks exposed to one thing. Number three, finance is supposed to be the market for information, right? That's why you have all these high frequency traders. If you have an information advantage, if you know something that someone else doesn't, you can make money, right? And number four uh, is basically that finance at the end of the day is supposed to be financing productive investment, right? So if you're a small hedge fund, you can make profits of 20% year after year after year in an economy growing at 2%. But if you're the whole financial system, you cannot. At some point, economic growth and gravity and financial returns have to match up, okay? These are four core tenets of finance. So where are we right now? Well, we're not in a very good place. So to begin, um, we are at the end of a golden age of finance, but that is ending. And this is basically that over the past several decades, financial investments across the world, mostly in large pension funds, etc., including our oil funds, have basically returned 6-7% year after year after year, to the point where if you look today at the size of pension funds out there, the CalPERS, the large Californian funds, the Dutch funds, our own oil funds, more than half of their present money value is coming not from new money that was paid in, but from financial returns, right? 60% of the oil fund's value is from financial returns. Fully 75% of the value of many of the American pension funds is simply from financial returns. It's not from new pension contributions, right? So can you imagine if those returns that we've been seeing year after year were to disappear, how big a hole in our pensions, our future prosperity we are going to end up with. But that is exactly where we are. So this cannot continue and here is why. It was a mix of unique factors that gave us this fantastic golden age of finance. Number one, interest rates across the world have fallen from about six to seven percent in the 1980s to about minus one percent today. Right? Basically, if you lower the interest rate, the value of your assets, whether it's your house or stock or anything that can generate future income goes up, okay? So this has been a one-way street across the past several decades. Interest rates have fallen by seven or eight percent. Number two, we had a fantastic time with the baby boomer generation. The more workers there are in an economy, the absolute number of workers, the faster the GDP growth, right? And we had all these people who were coming into the workforce and our GDP grew and grew and grew and grew until it stopped growing that much anymore, right? So that was a golden period. Number three, we discovered fantastic new technologies. We had high productivity growth, particularly with the, uh, with the dissipation of the new IT technology. We had productivity growth in economies that was higher than it was before, okay? Number four, Corporate tax rates across the world have fallen by an average of about 20%. And if you're paying less tax, which means you have more profit to distribute to shareholders, which means your value goes up, okay? Number five, ch when China joined the WTO, essentially what you had was 600, new, 600 million new workers were coming into the global workforce. And when you increase the supply of workers, it means that the returns to workers, the returns on wages falls, and it means that capital is able to generate a higher value, okay? I can continue, but there's a list of 10 factors that are rather unique in history that have driven this fantastic golden age of financial returns. Now, we know we have started aging, in Europe, for example, the absolute number of workers has already started falling. In Japan, it's falling even faster. What was basically contributing to the growth of GDP has now started weighing us down, right? Because where does GDP growth come from? GDP growth comes from only two places. One is an absolute increase in the number of workers, and second is how productive each of those workers is, right? So with the absolute number of workers starting to fall. Our growth prospects are now 
so bad that we'd be lucky in the developed world if we grew at one, one and a half percent year after year for the next decade or two. Number two is productivity, where essentially you can well imagine, it's commonsensical, it's harder to discover new things than to copy them, right? And we, for all our intellectual prowess, we are very proud that we are at the intellectual frontier of the world, right? We are the first ones to buy the Teslas, we always get the latest iPhones, and we talk about how fantastic our offshore drilling technology is. But every year it becomes harder and harder to discover the next new thing. China or India can come in and say, hey, those guys in Norway are doing something fantastically, let's try that. And they can catch up much, much faster than we can continue to grow, right? I mean, those are basically the only two things that drive economic growth. So we are now at a point where both population in the developed world has started to fall, and in particular, the working age population, and productivity, these new technologies that made us more and more productive, has slowed down to a level that we have not really experienced over the past several decades. And that means that our expected growth rates under a good situation over the next many, many years are gonna be one and a half percent, two percent if we are lucky. So that is the present situation. Now, where does that leave us? We, our savings, we have roughly $80 trillion of long-term capital between Sturbrand, between the various pension funds we have, between the Dutch and the Swedes and everybody else, right? About 80% of this is actually invested within developed countries, right? Uh, so most of the money, let, let's think of these three numbers, 80, 80, 80, right? So $80 trillion, almost 80% of it, invested within rich countries, and of that, roughly 80% is basically simply tracking an index. Either it's Standard & Poor's, or it's the Oslo Stock Exchange Index, or it's the JP Morgan Bond Index or something, right? So basically this money is money that you're putting a blindfold, you're saying, I'm gonna throw this, and it's gonna land everywhere, and that's fine. I don't care about the details. So that is where we are today, okay? So now imagine, can you possibly, and if you can, for how long can you generate seven or 8% profitability year after year in a set of economies that are grown to grow at one and a half or two percent? Right, I mean, the arithmetic doesn't add up and gravity is starting to catch up. That is one of the reasons why as of today, our dear oil fund has $70 billion in negative yielding bonds, right? So the oil fund is actually paying the German government and begging them, please borrow money from us. Okay, not just the German government, but LVMH, the French luxury group, Sanofi, the chemical firm, they borrowed in the market now, and they got paid to borrow money. In Denmark now, you can actually take a mortgage and get paid to take a mortgage out. Can you imagine? Up is down and down is up. That is the world we live in. How bad can the situation be? How much money do we have that we are actually paying people to borrow from us? That is where we've ended up. At the same time, that all of this is happening. Out there is a set of countries which has a young population, which is growing, where 10 to 12 million workers in Africa, 12 million Indians are coming into the workforce every single year, right? Imagine you get somebody who's never had a mobile phone before and you give them a mobile phone. Imagine you get somebody who no, has no access to co a computer. You give them a computer. You give someone who's very enthusiastic and hardworking access to a machine tool he or she has never had access to. Or you give someone who has no access to electricity. Electricity, something we take for granted. Can you imagine how much more productive these people can be? And the numbers are very clear. Year after year after year, for many years now, two-thirds of global growth has come from developing countries and the share is going to rise and rise, right? All of our future global growth is more or less going to come not from countries that are like us, but countries out there. If we ever want to make not seven or eight percent, but even five or six percent, even three or four percent return on our investments, we can't possibly continue to invest as we are investing now. 
What do we do about this? Now, if, as you do, uh, talk to financial professionals that I do all the time, they're going to tell you, oh, we have all this money, but there, there's no place to invest it, right? And if you go to Africa, if you go to India, and you talk to all the people on the ground, all these bright young things who actually got hunger, right? Unlike us in Norway, we've become complacent because life is comfortable, but these people actually have hunger and energy and enthusiasm, and they want to do things. And you tell them, hey, you know, but, but why don't you? Oh, well, there is no money, right? So basically, two things are true at the same time. We are sitting here and complaining, well, we have too much money that we don't quite know what to do with. And out there are entrepreneurs, out there are companies, out there are great, fantastic investment opportunities who are rightly complaining there is no money. What we are failing to do here, and this goes back to my tenets of the financial system, the only job the financial system has, the only job, right? Because the financial system doesn't produce chairs you can sit on, it doesn't grow food you can eat, it doesn't give you drinks you can drink. It's a support system like accounting or human resources, right? It is only valuable in what it allows others to create value out of. Now, in the United States, in 2007, just before the crisis, the financial system was taking 40% of the profits of the whole US corporate sector. Now, can you imagine if human resources in a car manufacturing company had 40% of the payroll, right? Or Noor Fund, the communication team in Noor Fund got 40% of the salary. I'm not sure that's the best allocation. I'm suggesting that, right? But, but, but I'm not sure it's the best sustainable possible allocation resources. That is where we were. And even with that level of rent seeking, the financial system failed to allocate capital as it should. The financial system is basically only a support system that has one job, and that is to connect parts of the world where there is too much money, not enough investment opportunities, to those parts of the world where the investment opportunities are, where there isn't enough money, and we are failing to do that, right? The financial system is supposed to make capital flow downhill. Number two. We have now ended up in a situation where this $80 trillion I spoke about, not only is it invested in assets that are guaranteed going to return at most 3% year after year over several years, that's if we are lucky, but also that are exposed to very high and rising risk. Where is world debt rising the fastest in the world today? It's in the United States and it's in Japan. Where is there less monetary policy space than there was before? After the last crisis and previous recessions, the US Fed cut interest rates by 5% every single time. What happens the next time an economic shock hits? What is Sweden and Denmark and the European Union and Japan going to do when interest rates are already negative, right? Leave alone monetary and fiscal space. What about the politics? We have 15 to 20% lower share of centrist parties today in the rich world. And many, any time, those of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, political risk was something out there always, right? It was in Africa, it was in Latin America. Now the world's single biggest political risk is one man, Mr. Donald Trump. The second biggest is another man, Mr. Boris Johnson, and no deal Brexit, right? Number three, if you stretch it, is possibly Prime Minister Salvini of Italy and the Euro crisis, which may come back. So basically, we have put $80 trillion of our savings into parts of the world where, at the most, if we are lucky, we will get 2 to 3% year after year, and we are exposed to common rising risks. And also, we don't have the tools available to react in a counter-cyclical way to save ourselves out of our next recession, right? That is where we are. And out there is a whole world full of young entrepreneurs where governance is still bad, but improving, where new technology can unlock miracles, where all of the future consumers already as of next year, more middle class people will be in the developing world than in the rich world, right? That is where the future consumers, future workers are going to come from. And if we fail to connect these two, we are all going to fail. This is the job that Noor Fund does, and I applaud Noor Fund for it.
Thank you, Sonny, for that provocative address. Uh, you certainly questioned a lot of the norms we assume. We're, of course, proud of what we do here at Norfund, but we also know that our approach is not the only type of investment that drives development. Developing as well as developed countries are teaming with young entrepreneurs, innovators who build business models to improve the world. We'll hear from two of them here on the stage, and they're more present in the back of the room, so please do grab the chance to engage with them both during the break and in the mingling that we'll have afterwards. Please welcome our first startup from the accelerator Catapult, Ms. Thea Somerseth Mirren, founder of Diwala. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Diwala. 1.8 billion young people today are living without a secure identity. But there's also limited trust to the documents you already have. Papers, stamped pieces of paper that nobody trusts. Costly and slow verification processes of these kind of documents for education or work history is also limiting access to jobs. Have someone ever questioned who you are and your abilities? How do you think it feels? Africa has the youngest, fastest growing workforce in the world. In a country like Uganda, 700,000 students graduate each year. And this is why we built Diwala, because there's limited mapping of their entrepreneurship, soft skills, internships. So Diwala is a digital platform that enables any organization, whether you are an NGO, university, or employer, to safely issue identity and verify credentials and certificates to a person. We use blockchain to make sure we can build trust back to data, add transparency, and also collaboration across public and private sectors. We've been working in Uganda for over a year, being the first to ever issue verifiable credentials and identity in December last year. We are focused also on thinking global, so we can work across digital platforms and borders. And this is why I'm here today. For raising capital, we're also inviting you to collaborate. Because ultimately, this is about a person like Shamim. A person needs to prove who she are, but also what she can do, so she can apply for a job and finance with less friction. In the Walla, we're passionate about building opportunities that people deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thea, for being the type of entrepreneur that we need to change the world. And uh, thank you, Sony, for uh, fascinating arguments uh, in terms of the need to reallocate capital both to developing countries, but also to the communications department in Norfund. <laughs> Much appreciated. Now, several actors are essential in working towards our common development goals. And in Norfund, we are only one part of that ecosystem. We also need non-governmental organizations and we need civil society. We'll now turn to them to understand what their expectations and hopes are to the private sector and how we deliver on improving lives in the developing world. Please welcome Birgitte Lange from Save the Children and Christopher Kleve from The Future in Our Hands. I'd like to start with you, Brigitte, uh, and understand a bit about your expectations and hopes to players like Norfun, but also the private sector in developing countries more broadly. Uh, what are your expectations, and how good are we at living up to those expectations? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to present a little bit of my thoughts on Norfund's um, expectations for Norfund. I'm the CEO of Save the Children Norway, which is part of the world's largest independent child rights organization, Save the Children. So obviously, child rights is our core business. It's the center of everything we do and through all our lenses when we look at other uh, organizations like you. 
And we like to see our, ourselves as a critical friend of Norfund. We want to work together with you, we want to collaborate, we want to share knowledge. And our main expectations to start there is that you see also children as your key stakeholders. Children are affected of everything in the value chain that Nordfund and the companies you invest in do. They are affected as children, they will be future employees, future customers, future business leaders. So if I should go one step further, we would expect you to do thorough impact assessments on how your investments affect children in the whole value chain. We would also recommend you to use a guide which Save the Children and UNICEF have uh, developed together, a guide which is called the Children's Rights and Business Principles, which will help you to make decisions based on what is in the best interest of children. So some really specific advice there for us, and I think that's uh, highly valuable. And of course, we need to see this both in terms of the impact that we, a negative potential impact that we might have, but of course also the positive impact on children that comes from creating proper and, sta and stable jobs. Um, Christopher, uh, your expectations to us, uh, are they along the same lines as Birgit is outlining here, or are they different? Uh, well, no, they're absolutely. Um, I would like to uh, maybe distinguish between two separate parts of it. One is to obviously to uh, avoid doing harm, and there's, uh, there are numerous international standards and there's specific standards regarding children and other, other areas to avoid uh, having negative harmful effects, uh, not only as a risk to individual projects, but for us, more importantly, to to the people in the countries involved or to the environment. But we also have, uh, I mean, we have extremely high expectations. I mean, we want, we want you to be the best in the world. And we also want you to be the best in the world in doing good. Because frankly, as NGOs, we don't really care so much if you make money or not. I have to, honest, honestly, I mean, sometimes we say we do, but we, 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 we care much more about uh, human development outcomes and environmental outcomes, for instance. Uh, and we want you to be uh, the best in that area, and we also want you to be able to document uh, that you are the best. And I'm very encouraged to see Norfund developing its metrics for documenting positive uh, outcomes of investments as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, of course, have different agendas, but in many ways, the same overall ambitions. And just a point on, uh, on caring about creating money or not. I think in one sense, we have in Norfund a development mandate. That's our ambition. But we also know that a prerequisite to achieve development is profitable enterprises. If you have a company that's losing money, you won't be able to create jobs. Mm. Right? On those different roles, though, if I may continue, Christopher, uh, we have different roles and we have different mandates, but as I said, in many ways, the same dream outcomes in, in this part of the world. Uh, how can we collaborate when we have different roles and different mandates? What does it take to get productive, critical friend <laughs> type of collaboration? Well, then it, it, it depends a lot. I mean, there's often civil societies are lumped together into one, one box, and we're not, obviously. Uh, and uh, different organizations will have different mandates and different roles. Some take the role of uh, advisors, almost sort of bordering on consultancies. Uh, others, uh, like ourselves, are much more in the sort of watchdog uh, role. And then for us, it's important to, um, uh, to be understood as not really wanting to undermine the overall mandate of Norfund or undermine the, the role of of investments going into developing countries. Uh, we want to be a critical friend as well, but uh, that also means that we, we want our criticism to be embraced and uh, by all means challenged, but, uh, but not uh, sort of seen as a sort of hostile move. I mean, we, we, we do basically want the same kind of thing. And, uh, so you basically want us to listen. Well, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> a good start. <laughs> to paraphrase our Prime Minister, I would use those words, yes. <laughs> uh, Birgitta, some thoughts on you, from you on uh, our different mandates, but our, you know, we have the same overall ambitions. How can we best collaborate? 
Yeah, at first I would like to say that I share very much your opinion and I've also had a very good impression of Nordfam. The first year I've been a CEO in Save the Children, I think you have reached out, you show a willingness to listen to criticism, constructive criticism, and uh, as a critical friend, <laughs> there are three main areas that we as Save the Children would like to collaborate with you in the future. First one is on the issues of chi children's rights, which I mentioned. We really like to share our knowledge. We operate in 120 countries. We are on the ground, as you are also, but on, with different pers perspectives. And we would like to share knowledge, uh, be um, co uh, cooperate in cooperation with you on the matter of children's rights. Secondly, we would very much like to cooperate on the issue of taxes to make sure that Nordfund in your investments are very concerned about the taxing policies in the companies you invest in, in the countries you invest in. And the third one is uh, the issue on the commercial primary schools, which we think is uh, an issue that needs to be debated and discussed, and we would like to come with our points of view and share our knowledge and thoughts on that issue. So three very specific invitations, and, and we thank you for that. Just a very quick point on tax policy. Uh, we do expect and require all the companies that we invest in to pay the taxes that they're due. We also have a new tax policy soon to be out on our yeah. website, so watch this space. Uh, Christopher, developing countries are, of course, many things, um, but often we're presented with a picture of them as being in despair and poor and corrupt and everything mm -hmm. is just going haywire. What can we collectively do to ensure that we don't present that narrow-minded, rather depressing and sometimes demeaning image of least developed countries? Well, I think uh, what, what Norfund is doing and sort of expanding that space of having sort of uh, equal-based trading relationships and investments uh, could contribute to uh, having a more sort of nuanced picture of of, of Africa as a continent or uh, people in developing countries more generally. Um, but I think it's important also to remember that there is a lot of problems out there. There is, there, there is a billion people roughly who have not enough food to eat. There is misery, there's war, there's refugees. With climate change, there may be more of that in the future. But it's important also to, for, to not go into the other uh, a pitfall of presenting too much of a rosy picture and it's all if they just get a, bit, a little bit of capital and uh, then everything will will sort itself out automatically. I mean, the, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of objective need out there and uh, it needs to be balanced, I think. So in this kind of sound bite driven world, we need to yeah. try to be more nuanced than uh, maybe the yeah, demand is. Boring to say, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I'd like to, to wrap up by asking you both the same question, which is, what is the one thing that you would challenge us in Norfun to do better? But there's also a second part to this question, and how can you help us <laughs> achieve it? Brigitte, let's start with you. I think <laughs> I basically already said it. Uh, we want you really, to of course, like already has been mentioned, to de uh, deliver on out development outcomes. That is essential. But we really want you to focus on children, the most marginalized, so that no one is left behind, like Christopher was talking about, uh, the most vulnerable children, to see children as stakeholders, to recognize the rights of children, and to work closely with us on all issues related what to will children's you do rights. To help us get there? We will share knowledge, mm -hmm. we will talk with you, we will share information, and we will share be best practices in, in, with our expertise. Christopher. Um, what would you like to see us well, do and I, I how will you help the, us get there? Yeah, the, I think the key, key area to watch is renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Because Norfund is going to invest much more in rene renewable energy in the future, and it should. I think that's a good, uh, good idea. But there's, it's important to do that while keeping in mind that there are still people involved, there are people affected. Uh, the, even though a big wind turbine might uh, produce a lot of renewable energy and replace uh, coal, which is ex uh, excellent. Uh, people in Africa may also object to having a wind turbine in their backyard. Uh, they're not inherently different from us Norwegians. So 
uh, there, that doesn't sort of, uh, even though you're pr producing renewable energy, that doesn't mean that you can just sort of absolve yourself of all other concerns. But I do, I do want you to invest in renewable energy. <laughs> uh, so, and I think uh, as to, to what we can do, uh, I think we can be the critical friend. We can, uh, we can give advice, of course, and we'll obviously, if we find out that you put the wind turbine uh, and the people there don't like it, we might actually let you know in a public way. Hopefully we'll find out before you do and do something about <laughs> it. We can't promise we'll live up to all your expectations, but we can promise that we will listen to you, our good critical friends. Christopher and Birgitta, thank you very much. <laughs> now we've heard about the importance of the private sector in achieving development goals. We've also seen the hard numbers. Capital flows are not going where they're needed the most and where the growth is. In this next session, we're going to explore why. And to kick us off, have a look at this. What are the challenges and risks of investing in developing countries? What are the real risks and what is more perception than reality? And how might we be able to overcome those risks? To answer those questions, we have an exceptional panel. And they all, in one way or another, move money, hopefully both creating impact and a financial return. Our first panelist is Peter Damgård. He is the CEO of PKA, one of Denmark's largest pension providers, with 320,000 members, 90% of whom are women. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> we also have with us Esther Ndeti, who's the managing director of the East Africa Venture Capital Association that promotes private equity and venture capital in East Africa. Home, of course, to some of the fastest growing countries in the world. Welcome, Esther. Oman Lunde is the CEO of Oslo Pensionsforsikring, a life insurance company that is owned by and serving the city of Oslo. They have, have over the last years taken a strong position on sustainability and now have an investment portfolio with a carbon footprint 61% lower than the index. Welcome, Oman. Last but not least, our very own Eric Sanderson, EVP of Financial Institutions in Norfund. Hopefully you all know what Norfund is by now. <laughs> and we have more than 40% of our investment portfolio in the least developed countries. Eric. Yes. 
Now we heard from Sony that two thirds of the growth is coming from developing countries. And when we look at risks, the risks are maybe higher in the US or Japan than they are in these markets. And that in order to make a decent return, we cannot continue to invest the way we have been investing. I'd like to, to start with you first, Peter. And um, given what we've heard about the scarcity of capital and where capital flows are going, why is not more capital flows going to this part of the world? Um, I think it's because um, uh, ins the investors and especially maybe the institutional investors, um, they um, move in groups. Um, I know in Norway you have some thing called lemminger. Um, they move a little bit like that. You have to see how the rest are moving and then if you can see that they are actually are getting good returns, then you move after that. And so don't these lemons tend to move off cliffs collectively? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and I also think we heard today that the next, the next crisis is, is quite uh, close. And I agree that in, in the next two or three years, we might uh, see a big correction in, in the markets. Um, the second reason why it's difficult to invest in, in emerging markets um, is uh, because we don't have the expertise. Normally when we go into a new area, we either buy something in the market, um, and then the people in the market, the, the, pension, the managers have the expertise, or we have the expertise in-house. And I think in a many, a very many pension funds, there, there are not an expertise on uh, emerging markets. And then of course, uh, you will tend to stay at the markets you know, even though you can see there are opportunities out there. Um, and then I think the third thing is um, um, information. Uh, we, had a lot, we have a lot of information on the developed market. We have a lot of inf information on the US market, the Japanese market, also starting to get more information of the Chinese market. But if you look at the emerging markets more broadly, we have much less information. Mm -hmm. Esther, from uh, your perspective in East Africa, uh, why are we not seeing more capital flows to this high opportunity, high growth region of the world? Uh, does that resonate what Peter has said? Is there anything else that you're seeing from your perspective? Um, a, lot of what he, what, a lot of what he said is true. Um, but I think then there's also the element of real versus perceived risks when looking at Africa. And I really appreciated Sony's presentation earlier because I think that there's a... Um, there's a lens that is applied when you know, looking at Africa in general, not just East Africa. Um, and some of the risks that are you know, very evident in other parts of the world are sort of like treated differently when looking at making investments in Africa. W what kind of risks specifically would you say are differently perceived because they're African rather than American? Well, I think I'd, I'd, be, I'd bucket them into two, um, you know, political risk and uh, currency risk, right? Uh, and political risk, um, you know, is generally shared um, you know, on information media channels or you know, different publications as sort of like this very hard, um, very t turbulent, volatile region. Mm. And so well, that is back true. to the conversation that we had before with a picture of developing countries as being despair and difficult and risky. Yeah, and while that might be true, I think it goes back to sort of like looking at Africa as one country um, instead of 54 different countries and the different, you know, political situations are completely different. So where, whereas one area is maybe something around new elections, a change of guard, which in many cases is a, is a good thing because now you're looking at sort of like a more sophisticated and more balanced um, government coming into force uh, with a younger, you know, team coming, you know, into leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of, you know, that transition, of course, comes with a bit of sort of like reluctance um, on the ground in different, you know, um, regions, for instance. But then sort of like being able to understand that the different types of political um, risks and just being able to be able to apply the, you know, different strategies across the different mm. countries as opposed to sort of like, you know, giving one lens to the entire continent. Yeah. Exactly. We need to be more nuanced. Uh, Peter, we'll get back to you because you've already been dipping your toes into the African water to some investments. Mm. But first to, to you, Oman, you have uh, not invested in these markets, at least not yet. <laughs> Uh, no pressure. <laughs> uh, how would you, from your perspective, describe the developing market risks as compared to the risks in the markets where you do invest? 
First of all, I think I am the, I am the bastard that uh, Sonny Kapoor was talking about. <laughs> despite I think he was talking about himself. He was talking like. about himself, yes. Yeah, despite even I've lived in Tanzania, I've been to Ghana, I've been to Zimbabwe, so I, some years ago, but, but I know I, I, w I would like very much to, to invest in Africa. Uh, I think that what we have, when we have looked into investments in, in, in African funds, I think the main thing that we are lacking is, is proof of the returns. Mm. Uh, the returns as we have seen them from, from various funds haven't been particularly high compared to, to the risks that we see. There are some different risks from, from investing in, in, in in more developed markets, uh, there's some uh, obvious, like Esther was saying, there are some political risks, uh, which are may maybe, the, maybe the biggest ones. Mm. So it's the kind of the risk return uh, picture that is a problem. The other problem for a, we are not as big as PFA, is uh, we have uh, 100 billion Norwegian kroner now, is to, if you, did an investment, you would have to put up some kind of organization so that you can monitor the managers, you can monitor the, the underlying investments, and it would require quite a lot of more manpower than other, other investments that we have so far. Mm. And, and so f that's the reason why we <coughs> haven't done it yet. So on the political risk side, I mean, Sony was talking about the biggest political risks mm. out there as being Mr. Trump and, and Mr. Johnson, mm. as opposed to any political mm. risks in Africa. Mm. Uh, what is your view on political risks and how, in the way that we may perceive risks rather than the reality behind them? There might be, there, there might be, it might be less than what what my experience has, but uh, and and I guess you're saying is there there are 54 different countries with 54 different uh, uh, developments, but the experience so far ha has at least in, in in my view been that there there are changes to governments, there are uh, there are corruption problems, mm. which may also be a, a, a reputational problem problem at home uh, and. So far, uh, the amount of money that we would have to put into it, into an investment to to uh, to kind of uh, impact our returns, we haven't we haven't seen there. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not there compared to that risk that we perceive. Mm. That we might be, like Esther is saying, uh, looking at it as a bucket. Mm. And that is a, that might be a problem. Eric Oman mentioned proof of returns as one of the uh, challenges or, you know, the, the question marks uh, preventing perhaps someone from going into these markets. You've been and we've been in this, these markets for a long time. Could you say something about that, the proof of returns and to what extent that is a, a risk or a challenge? Yeah, I mean, uh, first to say, that of course, Northland invest in these markets, but part of our job is to get other people to invest. That's why I have the tie, because I'm the one who needs the money, and you, uh, you, don't, you have the money. And the, these two yeah, gentlemen so don't have ties? No. So when I go to Africa, I don't wear a tie. But, uh, but um, to answer you back to your question, we, so I've talked to a lot of different uh, you know, investors like yourself, and there are three reasons I hear why you're not going. One is the, the, um, you know, the, the, the belief that there is not the return risk profile is sufficient because of the lack of data. And then the second is the reputational effects, getting involved in corruption, embezzlement, and these things. And the third is like, we're lacking some sort of investable vehicles that are sizable enough to oh. be meaningful for us because it's otherwise going to be too much manpower to go into this. And I think, you know, all these three we can address in different ways. And your question was about, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the returns. And I think, you know, the returns are there. I mean, Orphan has had you know, 9% nine, uh, 9 IRR since the very beginning. And we have done a lot of, you know, very, very high risk uh, investments, which, you know, we wouldn't suggest to bring to uh, investors like yourself. So if it takes or like a more of a, uh, you know, the lower uh, risk high and uh, uh, parts of our portfolio, I think it would be even m much better than that. So I think the, the risk is there and if uh, sort of the return is there and the other DFIs and so on also, you know, have similar numbers. The c I think the question is, what is the risk? Because that's, 9% is is fine return if the risk is not too high. But I think the perception of risk going to Africa and, and these countries is much, much higher than what it really is. So we need some more way of documenting what is the risk. Because, I mean, in, in developed markets, you can have volatility and see historical data. We don't have those data to show mm. and to prove what the risk really is. And I, I don't know for sure, but my sense and my feeling is that it is possible to find a lot of good 
uh, risk return investments in these countries if uh, if you do it right. Uh, Omen also talked about the organizational challenge, and I'd like to, to play that back to you, Peter, because you've invested with uh, Norfund's Danish sister organization, IFU, uh, in SDG Impact, and you're also in African infrastructure. Could you say something about how you've been able to overcome the organizational challenge that Omen pointed to? <coughs> yes. We started investing in emerging markets 10 to 12 years ago. And, and when we started, uh, uh, we had the starting point that we didn't have the expertise really to do it. And then we looked around uh, to find out where to, could we find the expertise. And then we started a dialogue with the Danish foreign ministry, uh, and, and they also took in the Danish sister organization to Norfund IFU. And then uh, gradually uh, we worked together, and uh, we started also doing investments together. Uh, First, it was just investment by investment, uh, and then we started uh, setting up uh, funds together, uh, the, where one third of the fund comes from the public sector and two thirds from the pension sector. And first, we, we were only three or four pension funds that actually wanted to go into to that area, but uh, the, the latest fund we have had, there are eight or nine institutional investors together uh, with the IFU and, and the government. And this uh, qu uh, fund is actually quite sizable. It's uh, six, six billion Norwegian kroner, I think. Uh, uh, and, and that's, I think the reason we can do that today is because we have had this eight to 10 years to find out how to do it. And, and we have seen in some areas some very promising returns uh, and we have also done some failures. Uh, this, this is not uh, a free ride. <laughs> Peter, share a failure or two with us. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, this is not going to Denmark. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's actually being live streamed. Okay, so okay. You may want to think about no, what you're saying. No, the, the peculiar part is actually where we have seen the biggest failure until now, and we, we don't know for sure if it's going to be the biggest failure because the fund is not... Uh, I mean, we are not fully invested and the fund hasn't run for all the time. But uh, f uh, four or five years ago, we, we started an agribusiness fund. And we thought agribusiness, that's really something where you have a Danish expertise. And this fund invested in Africa. I also think one project in Latin America. But it actually showed that most of the most, uh, the most interesting projects were in China. So we did a lot of large uh, pig farms in China. And some of you might have read that now China has been hit by the African swine fever. And I think those investments are never going to have a return that's over one, uh, over zero percent. I think we'll actually have negative returns. And because we had this concentration risk, and we know that for as institutional investors that you should avoid that, but it looks so promising. I think that fund will never be a good fund. Eric, given that we are colleagues, I can't let you off the hook, right? So I need to ask you about your mistakes too. <laughs> okay, uh, we have done many mistakes and that's part of what we, um, you know, <laughs> we're trying to avoid, but it inevitably will happen. So it has to be diversified. But I mean, I think, you know, what's a, one, one example is like we invested into a, a financial institution in Southern Africa. Uh, it was a loan, it was an uh, equity, uh, you know, the uh, macro situation was difficult, uh, the state is quite involved in the economy in many of these countries, so then, you know, when the state finances suffer, then the, the uh, companies suffer, but that's okay, we can deal with that, but then what we weren't good enough on was, you know, the actually being close enough to the, in, to the company, because what happens then, management, you know, we're leading uh, uh, capital in different ways, and we should have been closer to it. We did this loan through a trustee, which was not close enough. So I think for me, the one of the learning is that, because uh, Sonia Kapoor was talking about there, it's hard to find investable uh, opportunities. Well, it's true because the, the opportunities, uh, in order to put money into these countries today, you have to be very close by and, it, uh, close and follow it up very actively. And that's hard for investors like yourselves mm. to do. But that's what we are doing, We're being an active investor in those companies. And we feel, and we see that when we are not sufficiently close to it, that's when we really uh, you know, uh, have a poorer performance than otherwise. Is that one of your concerns, Omen? This, if you're not close enough, then it might all go south? Yeah. 
I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's, the sh that's the short answer. I can say what we do, we have, I, I think we compared to no other Norwegian uh, insurance companies, we are very diversified. We have a lot of different asset classes. So there is no problem, uh, like I was talking to Ola Nofsta here, who was a previous colleague of mine, that there is no problem with we don't have an asset class, we don't have a bucket to put it into, because we, we can just buy another bucket. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so buying buckets is not the problem. Buying no. buckets is not the problem. So it's, but what we do like in private equity or infrastructure funds is that we follow up the manager and we follow the investments. Mm. That's part of, and, and, and that is a problem here. It, it requires manpower, it requires, it, it requires quite a lot of, of, um, of knowledge mm. that is, at least for an investor of a medium size like us, it's, it's difficult. Mm. But uh, if we grow, then uh, maybe. <laughs> Cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, we're going to continue the conversation in a minute. But before we do so, uh, I'd like you and the audience again to pick up your phones, go to menti.com, and answer the question that I think we'll have on the screen in just a second, which is, share with us your thoughts on what the challenges are when inv investing in developing countries. What do you see as the challenges? And then we'll see if you agree with uh, our panel here. While they're answering, um, Esther, uh, the mistakes that you heard about, are they the mistakes that you also see? I suppose so. So we, I was participating in a roundtable discussion earlier today, and um, one of the points that was made is some of the bigger private equity firms that came in very early into Africa have closed shops and, you know, moved off, right, Mo moved out. And, you know, the question was why? And, well, I don't have complete insights into that. I would, I would speak into first acknowledging that private equity and venture capital as an industry in Africa is still, is still pretty nascent. Mm. And we're still in the very early stages of that, um, you know, being in, in Africa. And so because of that, there's a lot of learning curves um, currently. Um, being able to understand other structures and the vehicles that are being deployed um, in Africa, are they, the, are they the ones that will work, right? Mm. Um, looking at, you can't, what I've seen is people trying to, or rather funds trying to apply traditional sort of like um, investment periods within Africa, you know, what I've seen that works is long-term um, sort of like strategies, mm. um, you know, looking away from sort of like traditional five to seven years, you know, looking more long-term into that, right? So in the investment horizons um, are also a challenge. Investment horizons are yeah. a challenge. Um, mm. If we, also uh, Esther, just for, for a second, if we just have a look at this, because my fellow panelists here, they can have a look at a screen in front of us. And we're seeing corruption coming up as the big one. Uh, governance, of course, governance and corruption are quite linked. Same with transparency, but knowledge, brought up by several of you is, is also one of the challenges. And then I think that we have a number of words that are um, uh, reoccurring. I mean, political stability or politics is, is, is coming up. Uh, network, local presence, actually being on the ground is another one. Infrastructure and culture, we're also seeing currency. And then I see perception up there. So risk reality, perhaps, mm. as opposed to risk perception. Uh, now, Peter, in uh, your investments, to what extent do you see these top three corruption, governance, perhaps some tra transparency and knowledge being main challenges? Um, if I started with, with the biggest word there, corruption, um, I, we haven't really seen, I think we have done a lot of investments. I think uh, all in all, we, we might have 30 or 35 different investments in the emerging uh, world. And, and actually, we haven't seen a lot of corruption. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's because we are lucky, but I think also because everybody is so aware of that this, this is the question and this is what we have to be aware of. And when we go into investments in, in this part of the world, it's nearly always together with IFU or is together with a, a larger <coughs> Danish companies that are, um, that are used to work in that area. And therefore, I think corruption is on all, on all, everybody's screen, and mm. so it hasn't been uh, such a big problem. But knowledge is, is a very big problem, and I think we are still at, at the different pension funds, but also in, 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 the, in the Danish IFU and, and with other stakeholders, 
we are on a learning curve on how to really to find out how to do this. Mm. Uh, but this is quite similar on we have invested uh, very much in, in the renewable sector. There also six or seven years ago we had to build up the knowledge and today we have experts in, in offshore wind parks and wind parks and so on. Mm. Um, so it takes time and, and you, you don't only have to build up knowledge in your own organization, you also have to build some kind of cluster where you can uh, get people from other organizations so that you, you, get, uh, you got, get this kind of, of um, like in other parts where we invest, there's no uh, a one uh, person you are dependent on that you really have a team on this. Mm. So uh, building an ecosystem around yeah. this perhaps. Uh, Eric, uh, corruption, to what extent do we find this in our investments and how do we... Uh, <coughs> work to avoid it or reduce it? We, of course, have a you know, zero corruption uh, you know, tolerance uh, policy, and that's communicated very clearly whenever we get involved. So, of course, there is corruption, a lot of corruption in these countries, and you know, we cannot eradicate it uh, on our own, but we you know, have to be clear, and we are clear, that uh, whenever we are involved, it's no tolerance for that. And, that's, and as long as that's clearly communicated, it's not offered to us, or you know, in this sense. Is it going on behind the scenes that we cannot find out? We cannot, uh, you know, uh, eliminate that o uh, possibility. But you know, it's something that to be just very upfront about. And most, you know, companies from uh, from uh, our side of the world are that. But I mean, there is it is things take long time, and uh, you can only guess why does it take so long time sometimes. And yeah. uh, so I, you know, it's there. But I think you know we we are just so clear we cannot be involved, and, uh, and that's understandable from from the outside also. Now, now, we've talked about several of the risks. Uh, I'd like to dig a little bit more into how we reduce those risks and how we, how we de-risk. And starting with you, Eric, what are the most effective ways to reduce risks or to, to de-risk, uh, including how we might be able to do that for others who invest mm -hmm. with us? Yeah. I think, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to set up, you know, first, as, as I said earlier, how to be close and actively involved. And that's hard for other investors to do. So we, have, you know, have a good partnership with KLP, for instance, the Norwegian Municipal Pension Fund. They are like... Oman and I used to work there both. Yeah, so they're our hero <laughs> and, you know, from that sector in, uh, in our fund. And, uh, you know, we set up, we have a sort of joint venture uh, with them on the investment side, where they opt in to be part of energy investments. They can be, uh, um, you know, involved financially without having to be involved you know, actively. They sort of outsource that to North Fund. Same on the financial side, and both on investment in banks and in microfinance. We have setups, you know, Arise and uh, Nordic Microfinance Initiative, where IFU is also involved, where we, we have separate teams doing this. So we're trying to set up structures where, you know, uh, sort of institutional money can actually put so, uh, some there without having to understand and have all the knowledge yourselves, but you have, have managers that, that can actually do it. That's what we try to do to set up these structures to, to help. And I think KLP has, you know, uh, committed close to $150 million with uh, North Fund in different, uh, in different uh, areas. Mm. Given what you're hearing, Omen, and not to put you on the spot, but do you think, <laughs> do you think some, <coughs> some of these challenges that you're facing, can they be overcome, say, in the, in the medium term? Uh, yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, I, I and what does it take, do you think? It, takes, it, it probably take, it, it takes capacity to, to do the research uh, gradually and find out, uh, get enough information so that we change our mind. Uh, it also takes uh, takes probably a higher portfolio, mm -hmm. uh, but um, pension costs for our customers are very high, so we get a lot of money into the into the fund. So probably it will uh, is, uh, continue to increase, mm -hmm. and so I mean I can see us changing our minds and doing something. And I mean, it's it's not that uh, I hope I I hope I got through that we are not negative to doing. Mm -hmm. Doing, doing the investments, uh, it is that we don't, at, at the present, we don't find the, the appropriate mix of, of returns and, <coughs> and risks and, and, and organizational capa capability to do it. And KLP is six times our size, so it's, it's a bit easier. Mm. But I can see those changing in, uh, during a couple of years, maybe. Mm. I don't know. If Esther, if we were able to catalyze and mobilize lots more capital to this part of the world, would you know what to do with it? I wouldn't, but uh, my members would. So we're an association. Mm. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not you personally. I wouldn't put that on you. But, yeah. but more, you know, are there enough uh, relevant and sizable investment opportunities out there that this money could be absorbed? 
Absolutely. Uh, so we've seen all the statistics about the, the fastest growing economies uh, in the world. Uh, with, you know, between East Africa alone, um, ranges between five to eight percent. So it's a growing middle class. It's a huge um, sort of like bottom of the pyramid that also needs to be served. The opportunities are endless. Uh, but what, one thing I want to really emphasize on is just having the reality check that a, a big chunk of the deals that are available on the ground are more smaller ticket sizes than you know traditional private equity across um, different markets. Mm. So you know we've we've done research where more than 85 percent of the deals. Um, investment tickets are below $50 million, for instance. It's a, it's a growth capital market, mm. and that has to be sort of like one of the things, um, you know, funds need to understand coming into the market. Mm. But in terms of um, opportunities, they're endless in every single mm. sector. Um, you know, with the growing, um, with the youngest, with the youngest um, population in the world, for instance. Mm. Um, so there's just so much opportunity, mm. you know, in infrastructure. The gap is at $100 billion, mm. um, of, you know, funding that's needed every year. Um, so. and I can just say, uh, as a sneak peek into what we'll hear later on, green infrastructure is one of Norfund's new mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, uh, to you, finding the right investment opportunities. Esther mentioned that they're there, but they might not be of the size that we're used to. Uh, are you seeing this as a challenge when you're going into these markets? Um, yes, certainly, and, and especially in Africa, I think many of the investments uh, that comes up in private equity, but also in, in green infrastructure, are actually too small for an investment fund like, like PKA. Um, so um, so there's, I, I think that's one of the, the places where the governments and also the, 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 the NOAA fund and EFU they can work actually to get uh, uh, projects developed from these small scale projects to larger projects. Mm -hmm. uh, normally we would say that if we go into an investment in, in a Danish or a Nordic context, uh, context, it should be at least 200 million or 300 million uh, Danish or Norwegian kroner. And there will be very few projects in Africa of that size. Mm. But we are, we are still looking, and, and one of the areas where we can do it and actually have done it in both in Africa, Latin America, and, and Asia is microfinance uh, through a fund of funds construction that in, invests in microfinance funds. And is actually shown to be one of our best investments we started 10 years ago. And this money is really coming out to, to the countryside, also in the African states. Mm -hmm. But that's because of the way, way it's organized. And I remember you telling me that you weren't really expecting anything in no. terms of returns from this particular investment. No, no, I have to be honest, but this is a success. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we started 10 years ago, and we actually started because our members uh, asked us, couldn't you do any kind of, uh, could you do some kind of investments where you especially are targeting women because we have 90% female members? And when, then we saw that microfinance, especially in both in, in India and Africa, is especially targeting uh, female entrepreneurs. And it's actually shown both to uh, reach a lot of entrepreneurs, but also it looks like it's going to give a very healthy return. Eric, uh, Oman, please, and then I, I have a question for Eric afterwards. Yeah. I think that, uh, as you said, we have worked uh, quite a lot on climate. And I think that climate change and changing the en energy structure and energy production is a field where this should be really possible to, 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 uh, to make quite a lot of very profitable investments which will, which will uh, further development as well, because you can, you can build up these small scale, uh, small scale power plants, windmills, et cetera, near to where people are, and, and they don't, you don't need all transmission lines, et cetera. Uh, so it's only f finding a vehicle to make it investable is, is of course important, because it's in itself very small scale investments. Mm. But that could be very interesting and, pr and profitable and create development. I think that's almost a comment to you, Eric. Now, you're our EVP for financial institutions, but you know quite a lot about what we do in clean energy. Mm -hmm. So, Orman's idea that these should be good investments and good for climate. Yes, I mean, uh, I think there are uh, clean energy investments. Uh, you know, it's a lot of very good projects there. They're both financial returns, mm -hmm. 20 plus uh, percent IRRs is some of the ones we have exited over, you know, over several years in, uh, in uh, US dollars. So I could see he raised his eyebrows so here. <laughs> it's possible. And it's not only small money. I mean, this $20 million mm -hmm. plus you can put into these projects. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we've done a lot with Scaltech uh, Solar in, 
in Africa and also other places. With uh, you know, too early to say for some of them how it's going, but some of the ones we have exited have been been very good uh, financially. So I think it's it's possible to find these larger projects that are has a, you know, that have a, you know a decent uh, risk return profile. Mm. We're going to wrap up this uh, panel very shortly, and I'd like to end by asking each of you the same question, which is. What is the single most important thing that you think needs to happen in order to mobilize more capital to, to these markets? Mm -hmm. And I'll kick off with you, Eric. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, knowledge and some influence maybe on, uh, on the regulators or pensions funds that you know, it's, uh, it's not such high risk factors on non-EU OECD investments. So to, for us to come up with a knowledge about the risk return, actual numbers, that can, uh, that can change this. Because I believe you are also you know, rational people when you see the numbers. Yeah. How <laughs> rational are you, Oman, on a scale from mm. 1 to 10? I, I, I think I, I score highly. <laughs> uh, I hope so, at least. Your uh, perspective on the single most important thing that needs to happen? It's probably, I, I think we have fairly equal views on it. I, I think there is, there is some kind of uh, biting its own tail here. D if, if you get more development, and as you have seen that um, Africa is growing, and from what I've seen living there in Tanzania from, uh, I was uh, from 76 to 79 and then returning sometimes, you can see that there has been an enormous development going on. And you can also see that there are a lot more people. Uh, so so, so uh, getting the development going will also, in, it will also increase the amount of, 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 of good investments to, to be made, I, I think. Mm. Esther, from your perspective, East Africa, mm. what's the single most important thing that needs to happen to mobilize more capital to this part of the world? Well, before I answer that, I'd like to say that there's a lot of data and sort of like the deals landscape um, in East Africa, in Africa in general. So maybe one of the things we need to do as EVC is just make sure that this data gets into your hands mm. um, <laughs> so that we don't talk about knowledge being one of the challenges here. There's actually a lot Would of information. Would you like me to pass cards? <laughs> 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 yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, I'd also love to see a lot more collaboration. So EVC mm. is working really hard um, to mobilize local capital. Uh, we're working with the local pension funds because um, currently private equity and venture capital is underpinned by foreign capital, which is great, and we'd love more of that. But I think one of the ways to actually attract more capital is actually having more local capital going into the investments mm -hmm. that are happening mm -hmm. on the ground. And, you know, so regulation has, you know, policy changed a few years ago. 10% of assets under management for pension funds in Kenya can go towards private equity. Um, and so currently, as we speak, we, in fact, this week, you know, we'll be running sessions where, like I said, you know, private equity is still very nascent as a, an asset class in East Africa. So we're educating pension funds. And if I could see some collaboration with, you know, players who've done this for, you know, long, a long, long time. So not just exchanging information, but also sort of like, you know, going into these um, deals together um, as a sign of collaboration. I think that would be really interesting. Great. Thank you. Peter, single most important thing that needs to happen from your perspective. I think if, if, if we take the knowledge and information part, it's also, it's also to, to tell the good stories because if I go back 10 or uh, 11 years when we started, uh, we didn't know a lot about it. We didn't really have any private equity funds or other kind of funds that have been invested for, for mm. such a long period that we actually knew the returns. Now we have, pin, we have funds that have been invested, that have also been exited, so we can go and tell what the actual returns have been, and that's extremely important. And then I think uh, we'll have a huge pressure, as you said, for investing more in renewables, and, and there you can clearly see that a large part of those investments are going to be in the emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just to add this, so we, we have tracked the 44 exits um, over the past 11 years, and you know, did a study, a publication, just analyzing um, 10 of them. Um, and I'd be happy to share with that <laughs> information with you. Great, so we need knowledge, but quite a lot of that knowledge, including the data, may already start to be available. In fact, it is, as both Peter and, and Esther says. But we need to share that data, we need to understand it, and we need to make it more widely available. And maybe that can go some way in uh, moving risk perceptions uh, to a different space and really understanding the difference between real risks and risk perceptions. It may also be a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, issue, as you alluded to, Omen, where you know, what comes first, development or investments? And we need both of those to, to work in tandem. And finally, of course, we need collaboration, I think, between investors in our part of the world, but not least, of course, directly with the investors in 
those markets. And the more local capital we're able to mobilize, the more that capital can work together with the international capital. Many thanks, Eric, Ormond, Esther, and Peter. Uh, we will now be moving into hopefully a long source after coffee break. Uh, we'll have reflections, hopefully, from you guys and refreshments at the back of the room. And there you also have the opportunity to visit some of the innovative entrepreneurs that you already heard from on the stage, from Divala, but there are more of them in the back. So please take the opportunity to visit them. And be back here at a quarter past two. Thank you.